Hello and welcome to the strategic analysis video. This is the penultimate video in the Estranti Pre-Scene Analysis video series for the strategic case study exam for February 2018 on Jim Company Royals. So before we start, a very quick overview to the case. The gym industry, particularly the budget gym industry, is the main focus for the latest case study. And this may be something that's not familiar to many of us. Now, of course, many of us have used a gym before. Probably all of us have used a gym before. But not many of us will know the real logistics behind the industry. How does it function? And the company itself is called Royals, as I'm sure you know by now. And it's a very successful privately owned organization based in Highlandia. And the way in which we are going to analyze the business is by use of the rational model. And so this video is going to be split into three different parts. We have the future, where we want to be, what we want to achieve or have achieved. And we'll look at that by looking at stakeholders, by looking at performance measurement, by looking at governance, ethics, etc. We'll then look at where the company currently is, primarily focusing on the SWOT analysis or the corporate appraisal, but also looking at the different environments, the business environment using five forces, the greater environment using a pastel analysis, and so on. And then finally, we'll look at the business strategy, in a sense, the bridge between where we are now and where we want to be in the future. How are we going to get from the now to the future? And we'll look at methods of growth and source matrix generic strategies. And also we'll summarize the strategies that you should be thinking about, the main areas of the business to focus on going forward. And as already stated, we'll kick off by looking at the future where they want to be. Starting by looking at mission statements. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with mission statements, familiar with Campbell's mission statements as well, which is the strategy in which we will use to analyze mission statements. And essentially what a mission statement is, it's a definition of what the company is all about. What are they trying to achieve? Why do they exist? Who do they exist for? And the good thing about a mission statement is it helps all stakeholders, be they employees, be they shareholders, investors, members, everyone knows what the company is all about. And it becomes part of the company's marketing strategy as well. And now we were given a mission statement in the case study. The Royals mission is to provide affordable fitness to everybody everywhere. Now, this is very straightforward and to the point, which is what a mission statement should be. It should be open ended, not something that is very tangible and in a sense, empirically achievable, because that's what a goal is. That's what a strategy is. A mission statement should be by nature, very large, very overarching. And this one is it's to provide affordable fitness to everybody everywhere. Basically, affordable fitness for everyone. There's no way of truly tangibly assessing whether that has been achieved or not, but it shows why the company exists. It believes that fitness should be for everyone and fitness should be for everyone everywhere. No matter where you are, who you are, you should be able to do something that helps you to look after your fitness. So quite a, a good, friendly mission statement. So let's look at the different parts of the Campbell mission statements or the good elements of mission statements to see whether or not this is achieved by this mission statement. So we've got four different parts here, starting with purpose. Why does the organization exist? For whom does it exist? And what does it hope to achieve? Well, this statement in a sense does satisfy that purpose? What does it hope to achieve? To provide affordable fitness to everybody everywhere. It exists to provide this fitness. The strategy is how will the organization compete? 
what kind of areas is it operating? It's operating in the budget gym industries, providing affordable fitness. That's its strategy to be affordable. The next tip is value. So what does the organization stand for? Does it stand for quality, value for money, innovation, etc. And so arguably you could link this back to affordable fitness as well. And finally, we have policies. Now, policies are the things that people within the organization are expected to follow in order to ensure the company meets the purpose, strategy, and value requirement. It's basically the, the credo of the staff of the organization. And the purpose of this is to ensure that everyone is working to the same goal, the same end. One of the problems you have with organizations, particularly functional structures, which is what royals do have in that it's split by various different departments, is each department may have their own goals. Each department may have their own objectives. By having a mission statement, by having a purpose, a strategy, value, policies to follow, it allows everyone to work towards the same end goal. So an okay mission statement overall, the purpose is definitely there. The strategy and value could perhaps be better defined. It doesn't really talk about what we value as a company, nor does it really say how we compete or the areas in which we operate in. There's no mention of the budget gym market as such. Now the next section looks at performance measurement. And performance measurement ties in with mission statements and ties in with strategies in that whereas mission statements, strategies, goals are quite overarching, they're quite the finish line, so to speak. Performance measurement is how well you are achieving that. What do you need to do better? What, do you, what are you doing well? In a sense, it's constantly looking at our progress towards meeting our end goals and reassessing the situation based on that. And the best thing to use is the balanced scorecard. Now, the balanced scorecard was created because in the past, most companies were only judged on their financial performance. Were they profitable? If they were profitable, that was good enough. But of course, we now know that there are so many other functions, so many other factors that define whether a business is doing well or not. And that is the purpose of the balanced scorecard. It splits analysis into four distinct categories, which then each have their own factors and measurements within them. And these four factors are the financial perspective, internal perspective, in other words, internal operations, learning perspective, otherwise known as the growth perspective, and customers. So let's take a look at each of these in turn. So now, whilst Finance may not be the be-all and end-all that it once was. It's still obviously very important. And factors that can be used to assess how well they're doing from a financial perspective include profit. You saw the company had increased in profit over the last year. And profit, of course, is essential for a, a non, for a for-profit organization to keep continuing. Return on investment, particularly if they aim to get other investors GEM are the current venture capitalists invested in the organization and they will want a return on investment. We saw from that forecast from years 2018 to 2020 that they were planning or they were predicting an increase in the return on capital employed, which will be good for investors. Cash flow, incredibly important as well. Even if a company is profitable as a whole, even if there's a lot of assets, etc., the the day-to-day, month-to-month cash flow through the organization is very important as well. Because of course, there are plenty of things that have to be paid, such as staff salaries, interest rates on bank loans, year uh, month in, month out, regardless of how profitable the company is in that particular month. It doesn't matter that, or by the end of the year, we're going to be profitable. Those kinds of costs need to be paid there and then. You can't go to your employees and say, well, I can't pay you this month, but if you work for the next few months till the end of the year, I'll be able to give you six months salary in, in one go. That's not how it works. They have to get paid monthly every month. 
And gearing ratios as well. Gearing ratios, in a sense, look at how much debt is running through the organization. One of the things that we did notice going through the pre scene videos is that the company is very dependent on debt financing. If you put long and short term loans together, then they have over 34 million in debt, which has nearly maxed out their credit facility of 45 million. And using the long term debt over equity method for gearing, their gearing ratio is 108%. So very risky at the moment, particularly given that they plan to borrow so much more to fund this rapid expansion. Internal perspective looks more at internal operations, how effectively, how efficiently we are running the organization. So we can look at things like employee utilization rates. We like to keep costs down because costs are very important. We're a cost leadership strategy organization and therefore staff costs are kept to a minimum. But if staff are not being used efficiently, then they are a wasted cost. We staff our gyms from our average 16 hours per day. Could it be that there are times where they do not need to be staffed? Just like over the evening, they don't need, to, or over the night, they don't need to be staffed because of the, the system that's set up that allows people to use the gym unsupervised. Could we be doing more of that in the day as well? On job, oh sorry, on time job completion rates, particularly for the furnishings of new gyms, if we want to get as much profit as we can, as much return on investment we can from a new location, we have to get that gym operational as quickly as possible. And so job success rates and completing under budget also come into that as well. To operate as efficiently as possible, we need to be completing these jobs on time. Space utilization comes into that as well. In the precinct, it mentioned about how they use technology to ensure that the, the maximum amount of space is used in the gym or is used as efficiently as possible. So we can score ourselves by how well we are doing that. We can also use that information to perhaps remove machines that are not being used and replace it with machines that are far more popular because we don't want a case where we've got 10 treadmills and we've got 10 exercise bikes and there's 15 customers in the gym, two are on the bikes, 10 are on the treadmills and three are in a queue waiting to use the treadmills. Because if that's the, the situation they find themselves in, then they'll be thinking to themselves, oh, I don't like Royals gyms, there's never any room on the treadmills, I'm gonna go somewhere else. In that case, it'd be better to remove some of those exercise bikes and replace them with some more treadmills. Employee satisfaction is important. We have very low staff costs, but the staff that we do have are well trained. They're very knowledgeable. They need to be trained in health and safety, etc. All of this costs a lot of money. And therefore, we don't want to spend time getting employees up to speed. We want them to stay so that we don't have to worry about those costs. It costs far more to keep replacing employees than it does to just pay an existing employee a bit more to keep them satisfied. So that's another thing we need to look at. Investment in IT mentioned as one of the, the critical success factors of the organization as well, mostly with regards to utilizing space, with regards to data and the online booking systems and all these other things that the company does that helps it run as efficiently as possible. So we need to look at how much we are investing in that and keep investing in that to ensure we're constantly at the cutting edge of technology. And if investment is the input, innovations are the output, and that comes under the learning perspective. If we look at companies like Jimgo, they are seeing huge increases in the number of people using these innovative virtual gym apps. And that allows them to cut their costs even further because now all the equipment is actually at the customer's or the member's house. They're not even having to spend money on physical assets for that, but they're still getting a similar amount of revenue for it. And that's the kind of innovation that we at Royals need to be doing as well. Other things related to growth could be the number of gyms opened and the number of projects completed. Projects could mean anything. It could be the introduction of a limited range of classes. It could be the introduction of an app system. It could be the various phases 
of growth linked to the number of gyms. So phase one, we're going to open five new gyms in this area and so on. All of these go towards scoring how well the company is doing with regards to its growth strategies, to its overall goal. We know they plan to open many more gyms in the next few years. There are 125 now. They want to be at 175 by the end of 2018. They want to be at 300 by the end of 2020. And new marketing initiatives as well will help drive more people into Royals gyms as well, because that's another thing they want to do. They don't just want to increase the number of gyms, they want to increase the number of users per gym. And so, of course, given all that, members are very important as well. One of their strategies and their critical success factors was gaining new members and retaining old ones. And so, of course, we need to look at the number of customers and repeat com customers as well. How many people have perhaps used Royals Gyms for a month or two and then not use them again? Has that person lost interest in fitness or have they gone to another gym? The more people that come back to the gym, the more profitable the gym will be because of course new customers need more marketing to get them to come in. New customers need to be trained and inducted on the machines etc. Whereas repeat customers, they pay the exact same fees and subs as new customers, but they already know how to do everything. Our inputs with regards to repeat customers are far less. A number of complaints as well, just like the story of if there's too many people on the treadmills, etc. That's the kind of thing that will also show how well we are meeting our customer needs. And perhaps the company could perform some sort of feedback survey in order to achieve that, or to, to get the kinds of information they need. So the next section relates to governance. I'll briefly give you an overview of the theory of governance before going on to the specific parts related to the case. So essentially governance is the way in which organizations are directed, administered and controlled with the aim of ensuring that the organization is run in a way that is right for all stakeholders. So essentially, ensuring that a business is run to benefit the stakeholders and society as a whole. So you know, it sounds very good. And it's worth noting that this is only applicable to UK companies and listed companies at that, companies that trade on the stock exchange. But that's not to say that there aren't things that we can take from this and apply to any organization. It doesn't matter where that organization is based. Just as in our case, it's not based in the UK. And it doesn't even matter if the company isn't listed because of course, it's all about running the business in the best possible way. So just because you don't, you don't have to do it, doesn't mean that you couldn't gain from it. Let's, let's take a look at some of the few key factors from the, the code of governance, what is considered good governance. And that's having a separate chairman and CEO. Of course, the CEO is head of the organization and the board is ahead of the CEO. And so the, the CEO runs the organization on behalf of the board and then the chairman is the head of the board. So if you had a situation where the same person was the chairman and the CEO, they might be setting themselves targets they know they'll be able to achieve. So they're not pushing the company, trying to get the most out of the company, trying to achieve its potential. The chairman is just setting themselves easy targets that they know they'll be able to achieve so they can get their bonuses. Independent non-executive directors. Now, these are people who are not employed by the organization. They sit on the board to, in a sense, act as the control for the executive directors to ensure that the executive directors are running the organization in a way that is beneficial for stakeholders and not for themselves. This, of course, it goes some way to removing the issues caused with the agency problem. Now, agency problem is essentially where directors are running the organization on behalf of the shareholders. Now, the shareholders own the company, the directors don't, but the directors are in charge of the company. So the directors perhaps aren't necessarily interested in the long-term viability of the organization. They perhaps are more interested in their short-term gains. So they may leverage short-term, uh, long-term sustainability, long-term growth, 
for short-term short successes, small successes, so that they can boost the share price of the organization, so that they can boost the dividends paid out to the shareholders and get their bonuses and move on. And so that's the point of the, the non-executive directors. Non-executive directors also need to be people who are skilled, knowledgeable, not just any old person. They, they need to know whether what the executive directors are doing is right or wrong. And they have to be firm as well. There's a tendency for independent uh, NEDs to not rock the boat because they're paid quite a handsome stipend for doing it. It's only a few days a year job. And so a lot of them don't bother doing it or don't bother sort of standing up, rocking the boat, where, of course, they have to. That is their job. And the, one of the main jobs of the, the NEDs is to sit on the Audit Nomination and Remuneration Committees. Now, these are three different committees that, in a sense, are the essence of what governance is, uh, ensuring that... Everything is done fairly and ethically. That's the audit committee ensuring that uh, executive directors are not using company funds to fund business trips and golf trips. Um, that the shareholders wouldn't approve of. For example, if you are if an executive director is taking a client to Dubai for two weeks to discuss a business opportunity on the company's dime in a five-star hotel. Well, it could have been, it could have just been a couple of hours meeting at the company's office. That would have been enough. Yet they chose to, to go on holiday for two weeks in a five-star hotel. That's not an effective, efficient, correct use of company money. And that's the kind of thing that the audit committee is responsible for stopping. The nomination committee, are in charge of selecting people to sit on the board, selecting the executive directors. And this to ensure that the, the chairman or the CEO doesn't simply bring their son or their daughter or their husband or their wife on board to the company to, to earn extra money for the family, to, to give them an opportunity. No, it needs to be someone who is right for the job, someone who is experienced, someone who has knowledge in the industry and generally someone who is not related to other members of the board because this of course affects their independence, this affects their ability to, to think and perhaps increase the chance of them being biased. And remuneration committees as well, these are the committee, this is the committee responsible for deciding the pay on the directors. And this is because directors pay and this directors has to be disclosed to the public. And so, of course, it's important to to come across with a uh, to come out with a fair level of payment. If the company that you work for is not doing so well, it made X million in losses and it's got to lay off employees. But then it's also found out that the director had uh, a 40 million pound bonus this year, which was a 20% increase on last year's, then people are gonna I think, well, why? Why is that director getting a bonus, a raise, when the company has done worse this year than it did last year? The company didn't meet any of its targets. It was supposed to be trying to break even this year and it made millions in losses, yet you've given the director a bigger bonus than you even did last year. That's the kind of thing that will really frustrate the public, uh, turn the public against the organization, turn the shareholders against the organization, turn the the other stakeholders, actually employees against the organization. And that is what governance tries to overcome. It's also worth pointing out that governance has a risk management focus, particularly with regards to the audit committee. Uh, so the audit committee is often charged of creating things like risk registers, and other things like that, that ensure that risks are being dealt with. Because it's one thing to identify risks, it's another to actively go about mitigating the impact of those risks. And that's one of the, the values of corporate governance. Financial reporting and control. 
Also very important, ensuring that all the statements are done as per the laws of the particular country in which the organization operates in. Ensuring that directors have all the information they need because of course they can't really be judged on their decision making if they aren't given the amount of information given. So this, this system is to ensure that all executive directors are provided with all the information that they need to facilitate good decision making. And with regards to decision making that all directors are involved in it. And this means even if it means taking you know something as simple as a show of hands just ensuring that everyone is involved. Often in certain situations, if you've got say founders of the company still sitting on the board, the founders are very powerful. Everyone agrees with what the founder says and that's against governance. The whole point of a board is that there is a consensus amongst a group of people rather than one person making all the decisions. So if that isn't happening, if one person or two people or half the board are far too powerful, then that goes against the point of a board and thus against the point of good corporate governance. And regular meetings with both institutional shareholders and all shareholders at the annual general meeting. Institutional shareholders, of course, being things like your pension schemes and your big stakeholders, big shareholders like that. And it's important that we do this because of the fact that they have a lot of money invested within the organization. If they were to take their money out of the organization, it could cause a lot of problems with the market because the, the share price might drop as people may be thinking that there's something wrong with the organization or it's on the decline because this major institutional shareholder has decided to take their money out of it. So that is governance from a theoretical perspective. So with all that in mind, let's now look at governance applied to the case. Now, of course, as a private company, not based in the United Kingdom, there's no real need for them to apply governance. But of course, as it's the way in which an organization is best run, administered, controlled, etc., in the interest of all stakeholders, there should always be something that we can learn from it. Now, there's definitely the chance of some conflict of interest occurring in the case. The main one being Carl Judd, who is the chief financial officer. And the reason why there's conflict of interest risks here is because that he used to work with the Ministry of Health. And we know from the precinct, know from those articles that the Ministry of Health are planning on rolling out some new health initiatives. So if you were to use his position or his former position within the Ministry of Health to help get a good deal for Royals or to help ensure that Royals gets a piece of that initiative, then even though that's good for the company, it's unethical and thus is not good governance. So we have to be in control of these sorts of things as well. And the same for the two brothers, the two founders of the organization. They both have close ties, either running or were running big organizations that specialize in sportswear or specialize in buildings. Two things of which could be involved with Royals Gyms. We could start selling sportswear. We could perhaps start buying new land from this property development company that was owned by Frederick King. Now this of course is not good for the, the company because it does mean that we are using power, we're using, uh, the board members are using their positions to perhaps circumvent due process to unfairly gain for themselves. But of course, we do have a rigid process in place. You remember from the pre scene, there was a rigid process in place for analyzing any new potential site. And thus, if it doesn't fulfill all that criteria, then it's not a good location. If it does, then it is a good location. It doesn't matter whether it's a site owned by Frederick King, as long as it's gone through due process, it's not a contract, a conflict of interest. And on the subject of the, the two King brothers, we have an issue of the agency problem. Now the agency problem essentially exists where the, the board, members of the board are not owners of the organization, the shareholders are owners of the organization. And 
instead of running the company in the long-term interests of the company from a sustainability perspective, they run it from the short-term profitability to try and get their bonuses, etc. Now, this is reduced dramatically in this instance because it's a private company and because the two brothers are owners of it. And therefore, when the company does well, they do well. So they're unlikely to leverage long-term sustainability for short-term growth. However, a lot of the pre-scenes seem to suggest that there's the potential for listing and were they to list, this could suddenly become a big issue. Not necessarily for the King brothers, because of course they will still keep some of their shares, their holdings will be reduced, but they'll still keep some. But for the other board of directors, there would be a real chance of the agency problem arising. Now, if they do list, they'll definitely need to sort out their non-executive director situation. But even if they don't, they could still do with a couple of extra non-executive directors. Ideally, there should be as many non-executive directors as there should be non-executive. So a couple more wouldn't hurt because they bring wider experience to the board and review and check board decisions. And another thing that non-executive directors do is they sit on the remuneration nomination audit committees now. Of course, we know that the remunerations, people that decide on the pay for the directors, nomination, appointment of directors, and audit to overall check the kind of risk management running through the organization. And the risk was fairly weak in places, risk management. They had identified quite a few risks, but they had not really acted on them as such. There are a few risks that they didn't notice as well such as interest rate risks, which will have a huge effect on this company because it's so funded by debt. And the creation of these committees will be expected by the shareholders should they become listed. So a lot of the theory, a lot of the application surrounding governance does depend on where the examiner takes the company in your particular variant. Governance could either be incredibly relevant if they are talking about listing and may not be that relevant if they aren't. But it's important that we cover both bases. So I hope you've enjoyed this sample video and more importantly found it useful. Before I go, I'd like to quickly tell you about a few of the products that we do here at Astranti Financial Training, specifically for our case study courses. We have a study text which details all the key theories in which you will be expected to use in your case study exam, as well as details of how to approach the pre-scene and the case study. We also have a series of course videos detailing how to answer case study questions. This is actually an area in which many students struggle. Most of the scripts that I've seen, the failing scripts that I've seen, has actually been due to poor case study technique rather than lack of knowledge. We also have a series of pre-scene analysis videos based on the current up-to-date pre-scene detailing all the key bits of information and likely issues you may face in the exam. Next up is the industry analysis, a pack detailing information about the industry that the pre-scene company resides in, information about the key players within that industry and more background information on the industry in general. We also have a range of mock exams created for each level and based on the current pre-scene, which is a great way to get some practice in before you sit the real thing. We also offer marking and feedback on those mock exams so you can see where you are going wrong and where you can improve. Finally, we have the master classes. These are two one-day classes taken by our expert tutors to give you all the, the hints and tips you need to really add to your chances of passing the ex exam. Also, if you take our full course, we offer a pass guarantee, which provided you have met all the requirements of the pass guarantee, you will get a free reset on the next exam should you fail to pass. So once again, thank you for your time. If you're interested in any of these products, please visit the website www.astranti.com for more information. Thank you.